Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation. In this episode, we speak with Cameron Wilson, one of China's top football experts in China with the thick Scottish accent to go along with it. And when a Scot is talking football, for those North, for those North American listeners, that means we're talking soccer. Cameron comes from a rock solid journalist background and is a communication specialist with a profound understanding of Chinese culture, as well as a writer on all things Chinese football as well. He has been published by World Soccer, The Guardian, and Agence France Presse, or the AFP. He is also the founding editor of Wild East Football. We cover the full landscape of football in China, its history and background, both the men's and women's teams, its fans, professional teams versus grassroots organizations, football as a career path in China, the growth trajectory of the sport in China, and what China's football leagues need in order to become successful. Enjoy. Grassroots football in China is quite unlike grassroots sports elsewhere because there's simply a lack of people involved, which seems counterintuitive when you think of the population in China, but the percentage of kids playing football in China is tiny. And that is because there's not really a casual or leisure grassroots sports system in China. Everything is based on identifying young talents at a very young age and you know whisking them off into like an Olympic gold medal factory. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally minded brand should ignore. But entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber and Facebook. Times are changing and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early stage tech companies enter the Asia Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Cameron, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on today. Hi Todd, it's great to be here. It's great to have you. As we usually do, a quick introduction of yourself, how you ended up in China and where'd your interest in football come from? So uh, I graduated for in in the year 2000 and I did the foreign adventure thing, which meant for me was uh, teaching English in China. Um, I really enjoyed the first year in China, but I didn't want to teach forever. So I came back to UK, Scotland exactly, and was a journalist. But then after a few years of that, I was, life back home wasn't the same. I had to, I just to go back to China, came back in 2005. And I've been here since then, basically doing a mixture of uh, journalism and communication work. And my Chinese football thing is like a like a labor of love, basically. Well, I think a lot of the best things in life come from being uh, have, having them as a labor of love. So yeah, absolutely. And we're going to dive into that. We, we want to talk a lot about the football scene in China. And for those of us, and I say us because myself being in North America, uh, just forewarning you, we're going to say football a lot. But what we're talking <laughs> about, what we're talking about is soccer. OK, just so we'll make that very clear up uh, up front here that the, the football commentary is uh, also referring it to to soccer. So uh, I know it can be blasphemous uh, over in, in places like Europe to call it to call it soccer. I'm sure it's just something you would never do. Well, it's not because that's that game. You kick the ball with your foot, you know, there is there is we could just we could just call it that game. You could kick a ball with your foot um, and then everybody would be on the same page. Why don't you give us a quick introduction into China's football landscape? And then I'll come at you with a couple of questions after that. All right. So professional football in China has been on the go since 1994, uh, where they basically launched a pro league. Uh, Since then, its development has been somewhat uneven, to put it mildly. The early years of the league was in the 90s, it was pretty successful in terms of the crowd's uh, people were glad to have pro sport of any kind to watch, I think, back then. Uh, but then there was a lot of corruption scandals and the game floundered. Uh, and then uh, around 2010, there was a big effort to clean it up. Uh, and then slowly, yeah, there was more money came in. In 2015, the government of, uh, launched a, uh, a massive program to reform the, ma- the game. Uh, and then there was huge cash came in. But in the last few years, that's all collapsed because there's been not many good results came from that 
in terms of the national team's performances, which have been consistently terrible since since the beginning. Uh, so that's the potted history. And as we speak, Chinese football is basically in a, uh, a pretty bad place right now. Is there more to the evolution worth mentioning over the last 30 years? I, I think that for the point of view of your audience, I think there's a good, there's, there's some interesting parallels with the, the North America is basically the, the US launched the MLS around, I think it was 95. I think it was a con, as a condition of getting the World Cup in 94. And ever since then, the US has been a, almost a, every single World Cup Ex- excluding the last one, but that was a thing that was, most people would agree that was an, an anomaly. So Chinese football's history is basically, professional history is pretty much the same length of time as the US, but they've both taken kind of different tra- trajectories. And I think the point to make is that whether or not, you, whatever you think in MLS, the US has been a consistent World Cup qualifier since it was launched. And so that so basically, the domestic league in the US has supported the national team. Whereas in China, it's not had the same effect at all. Whereas China's only been to the World Cup once, which was in 2002. And they basically went home after three defeats and scored no goals. So that's the context, which I think is interesting to see. All right. Well, we're going to dive into the lot, into that a lot more. Is it safe to say that football was the most popular sport in China until basketball? And that's making an assumption, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that basketball has overtaken football as the most popular sport in China. I'm not sure, to be honest, Todd. I think I think basketball is is definitely a, a huge sport in China. Uh, you can, I think, I would say more people play basketball, um, but I think more people pay to watch football in China like if you go to the stadium some of the stadiums in China there's a really big crowd and certainly I think the football culture although it's not widespread there are pockets of it in China where the the local clubs have really active fan bases I think that is more developed than basketball but I think in terms of people who play the sport I think basketball is is, is bigger and I think it I think it I think it always has been, to be honest, or at least I don't think there's been a time when football was surpassed in that way. In my opinion, there is two factors that I think could be highly influential or manipulating which one is more popular. And I I think because basketball is predominantly North American, so you have a huge ocean uh, between where it's most popular. And so I think that that proximity where football is so big in Europe and it's closer geographically to China, there's a lot of European influence that comes from that side of, you know, the landmass that seeps into China. But on the other hand, what we had was the, and let's just call it the impact of Yao Ming. And so I'm I'm curious what your thoughts are on how those two if those two instances those two things have impacted both sports. Yeah, I think both both your points are really relevant. Yao Ming is you can't underestimate. He's a I mean he's he's a big name, mm-hmm. <laughs> both physically and uh, yeah. and, and, and and in terms of his repute. Uh, yeah. His influence in, in Chinese basketball is, but well, the popularity of basketball in China is obviously is, is massive. Uh, I think the point which maybe is lost on some people who only follow basketball is NBA is the world standard for basketball. It is one entity and it is the biggest and the best basketball league in the world by far. But football is a vast myriad of, of different leagues in different countries. And whilst there's maybe, you know, four or five or half a dozen, say, leading leagues in Europe, which are big, it's football is a much more uh, it's much more diverse in terms of where you might like to um, get your football influence from. I'm just starting to think about how a sport is grown, where the interest starts to arise how you know where where it comes from maybe you can talk a little bit from a macro level what does grassroots football look like in china well this is part of 
I mean, I, I, uh, how to how to say this? Um, this is really the 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 root of all the problems in Chinese football. I didn't, I didn't make this clear in my introduction, but I, I've actually been following Chinese football for sixteen years, and uh, I'm also the 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 founder and editor of World East Football, which is a, a website which has covered China for ten years. So, I mean, I've I've really seen, I've had a ring set view of how things have developed. Grassroots football in China is is quite unlike grassroots sports elsewhere because there's not there's simply a lack of people involved, uh, which seems counterintuitive when you think of the population in China. But the, the percentage of kids playing football in China is tiny, and that is because there's not really a casual or leisure grassroots sports system in China. Everything is based on identifying young talents at a very young age and, you know, whisking them off into like an Olympic gold medal factory. Um, it's changed in, in the last, in the last kind of decade. There's, there's definitely been a growth in kids football in China. Uh, there's certainly a lot of kids playing football at school. Uh, the government's made school football a big thing and that's increased the number of kids playing it. But there's, there's basically just not a really widespread grassroots football culture in China. And that's basically that's basically what holds it back. You know, if we look at the Yao Ming example with basketball, Yao Ming became a hero. He became a legend. He became an icon that represented the sport, but drove kids to want to buy jerseys and kids to want to go out in the court and start, you know, playing and imagining that that's who they were. And... I think back to when I was a kid and becoming interested in sports, we follow our heroes. And sometimes our heroes are the elite players in the game. Sometimes our heroes, when we're kids, are our parents because they're playing sports and watching sports and watching them on TV and sitting around, whether it's, you know, American football on Sundays or just hockey night in Canada, in Canada, watching hockey on Saturday night, watching your Canadian teams. And so our parents as our heroes, as young kids and their interests, it, we absorb those. It could be our older brothers or sisters and they're our heroes playing it. There's so much of that influence that drives the interest at a young age. And I'm looking at China going, how many of the parents in China know the sport, played the sport, are interested in the sport, are fanatical about a certain team or, you know, following it or catching the games? You know, that's where I think there's going to be a uh, a long tail process here. Yeah, I think the problem is... The problem is is really fundamental, and even though I've been here a long time, I've been following the sport for for many years. It's only in the last few years since since I actually became a parent that I realise the the pressure on Chinese kids to spend every waking moment doing homework or academically oriented activity to 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 increase their chances of getting a good score and you know the Chinese entrance university entry the Chinese university entrance exam is called the Gao Kao. That is first and foremost what a kid's life is all about in China. It's impossible to overstate the relevance of that. And it's it's difficult for, for Westerners to get their head around that because we live a, a life where as a kid, you're, you're encouraged to do lots of different things. And by all means, uh, education is really important in a Western context, but it's not like the be all and the end all, but in China it is. And the, the thing about China is that the, the pressure in Chinese society is, is just absolutely massive because there's no, there's no room for error. If you don't get into, if you don't get a good score, if you don't get to a good university, then you can't get a good job. And crucially, you can't financially support your parents when you get older, and because China doesn't really have the same social safety nets as which exist in a lot of places in the West. So that that element is just so so completely fundamental to everything. And basically, there's no time. I mean, for example, kids come home from school at um, five, uh, four or five o'clock, whether they're doing homework till to all hours, or they're doing some kind of lessons like. Um, extra English lessons or maths lessons or some extracurricular activity because the pressure is so high that parents don't think they should, their kids should do anything 
other than study. It sounds brutal, and it is. We've talked a lot. You know, this this comes up a lot, and and it has to because whether we're talking about art or music or you know professional development or entrepreneurship and having an innovative mindset or you know what have you, the, these are typically the talking points that these conversations boil down to. Um, it's, it's very, very interesting. It's very relevant. And even when it comes to sports, it's, it, it got, does come down to the same kind of thing. I'd like to go a little bit micro now and let's dig into things like what are the most important teams in professional football in China? You know, is there an equivalent of Man U, Arsenal, Real Madrid, you know, what kind of crowds do they draw? Uh, you know, what do the stadiums look like? Who owns these teams? And what is their management style? What is their ownership style? You know, who are the biggest stars? What is the state of Chinese professional football at a club level? All those things on the table. You don't necessarily need to knock each one of those out. But, you know, talk to us a little bit about how that stuff looks, uh, you know, on the ground. Well, a general point to make is that all the clubs are owned by large companies, conglomerates, or uh, typically real estate. Um, the, the reason for that is that Chinese football clubs don't make any money. They they are massive uh, holes which burn ridiculous amounts of resources. That's because the, the whole business ecosystem around sport or spectator sport in China is, is very underdeveloped. Uh, and again, it's related to what we said a moment ago, is that people don't necessarily have as much leisure time or the willingness to devote money or spending it on, on watching professional sports. Um, but the biggest teams are basically, you basically got four teams which are significant in some way. Let's say Beijing Guan, Shanghai Shenhua and uh, Guangzhou FC, which until recently was known as Guangzhou Evergrande. And also you got Shan, uh, Shandong who are uh, quite a long-standing successful team. I'd say uh, Beijing and Shanghai are obviously they are two clubs which they kind of embody probably the biggest rivalry in China. Uh, the two biggest cities is China's like a lot of countries where the two biggest cities in any country will have a rival about who's who's the biggest, who's the best, um, and, and that gives some interest and phenomena because in China, you know, it's quite quite tightly. People are pr- quite restricted and and what they can say in, in, in certain ways. Uh, but football is like a kind of one of the few open forums for people to express their local pride. And that's an interesting aspect that I mentioned the Chinese football. Uh, the management style is it's quite old fashioned. It's very kind of state owned enterprise. A lot of a lot of cronyism, professionalism in terms of the way the clubs are run is often pretty questionable. So in that respect, it's, it's, there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, but the game has been going in a... It's more professional now than it was 10 years ago, but there's still a lot of room to, to clean things up a bit more. Are they are they paid well? Like, is it a like a financially viable future to be a professional football player in China? No, not really. Because you might get paid really well if you are a top Chinese player. In fact... They get paid too well because, because basically clubs need to, they have a rule where they have to have, I think, at least eight, seven or eight players on the pitch need to be Chinese. So that basically creates an artificially high market price for Chinese domestic players. The upshot of that is that these guys are, they're quite, they're good in Chinese terms, but they're not really good enough to play at a higher level overseas, like going to Europe. So they never really get a chance to, to develop uh, to pit their skills against higher quality players in a higher quality league. Um, but this is a pretty serious problem you bring up because, I mean, who's going to be a Chinese football player? The, the, the career is short. The, the, you know, the gains, unless you're in that very top echelon, most Chinese football players are pretty poorly paid and it doesn't offer a really good attractive career prospects. What about endorsements? What about ad revenue? What about... TV spots, doing commercials. What about those aspects? Is is it the same type of industry and opportunity for Chinese football players as it is for major sports stars from other places around the world? 
Not really. Uh, the problem is that Chinese football, because it's underachieved for so many years, that the players are generally not held in great prestige. So the market value reflects that accordingly. But I think in general, I'm not an expert on, on that side of things. I, I just base it on my own observations, my own understandings. But I think, I mean, unless I mean, unless you're really like a top top name, like um, like a Yao Ming, for example. Uh, or like in past years, you'd have like a Lisha, like the, the the hurdler. Unless you're someone who's really been a world achiever, like Li, Liu Shang was a gold medalist, or Yao Ming was a star in overseas in Frembier, then I think the chances, I think the endorsement opportunities are are limited. We know that a lot of what happens in China when they want to do something, it's definitely top down. So. What about government interest? Is football in China getting that top-down updraft or tailwind to help the sport? Is there any desire or any upside that can be seen from getting more of a uh, PRC Central Beijing kind of push to help the sport? I mean, Xi Jinping is this famously a football fan. The 2015 football reform plan in China was like a, a really massive plan to overhaul the sport, but the problem is in China, when, when the leadership focuses on something, if they make something like a national goal, it, it draws attention to all the, the guys lower down who are trying to climb the political totem pole. Uh, and that, all that results in is people who are politically ambitious getting involved in the administration of the sport, but these are people who have no next to no football knowledge or understanding of how football really works. And their personal goals may not really can coincide with what is good for development of football. So that's that's the political dimension in, in China's... In some ways, you know, you can't really get anything done in China without having government support. But at the same time, there needs to be a balance where the government opens doors, but then it's it's techni- people who are technically proficient in that particular area who actually make the decisions. But that, it's very obvious from looking at Chinese football from a bigger perspective that uh, politics... and basically informs a lot of the decisions and it holds the sport back. Well, talking about balance, let me ask you, what kind of gender equality is there in the sport in China? Well, there's, there's a women's league and it's, it, gets a lot of, it gets a lot of coverage and there's, there's definitely an increasing level of support for women's football in China. But I mean, I wouldn't say there's definitely a big gap between coverage of the men's game and coverage of the women's game, but I think that's probably true in a lot of places i know you watch a lot of uh the men's team uh and what they're doing in china how have they been doing these days and i'm curious to know how it compares to 10 years ago or 20 years to go i i'm just curious if they're on the upswing if they're moving forward if they're getting better if they're improving even compared to you know other international teams or are they still the same or potentially not performing even as well as they did 10 years or 20 years ago? They, they've they been very stagnant over the last 10, 20 years. Um, they, they're basically probably worse than they were 20 years ago. 20 years ago, they were able to qualify for World Cup. But since then, things have really... I wouldn't say they've gotten a lot worse, but they are definitely not as good as they were. And, and, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of reasons for that. The, the main reason is that... Chinese football was hit with a lot of corruption scandals in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and this really reduced the prestige level of the game. And a lot of people perceived it as kind of bent or it was dirty and it wasn't something to get involved in. I think it's, that aspect has been improved a lot in the last, I'd say the last decade. But the damage was done and because of the way football works or anything works in terms of uh, developing people to support our project, it takes quite a long time for the development to come through again. I know as a Scot, you are born with an incredible intrinsic understanding of exactly how football is played. Uh, <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's yeah. fair to say, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't mean we're good at it, no. but we do understand it, yeah. You know what? You're one of the best coaches on a TV that you can find. At a tactical level, and I feel comfortable asking you about the tactics, <laughs> on the pitch, when they play, how 
would you define them as football tacticians or strategists? How well do they play? Maybe even what do they do well? And where would you say that they they tremendously need to improve? It's a cliche to say this, mm-hmm. but it's true. Uh, that is that the, the tactically pretty well organized, but it's almost like they're too organized. There's not any... Um, Risk taking, there's not creativity and there's not sparks which create mm. chances for goals to be scored. Um, but then again, it really it, it can vary a lot. I'd say the national team, they're good at following instructions if the instructions are not too complicated. Like you won't find, like for example, four four two information, which is four defenders, four midfielders, two strikers. That's been a kind of tried and tested classic formation for the last, um, I guess, 30, 40 years in football. But if you look at Europe, European leagues now in the last decade, that's kind of fallen away a lot. But in China, you still find that formation being employed. And there's nothing actually wrong with that. Uh, because if that is a formula which works and players understand it, then that, that's better than trying something fancy which players don't understand. But I think that's probably a good way to illustrate overall where tactics are in China. Well, because I'm looking at their national rank it's saying 75th well international i guess that that's what the national team is internationally ranked 75th right that's probably not sitting very well with those who love um football in china and so my question you know kind of on that level of where do they really need to improve in order to, I mean, where do they need to improve? Obviously, if you improve, you would then hope that you would move up. Um, and I and I guess just moving up is is playing better and beating better teams, and therefore you get ranked higher. But where do you think they fundamentally need to drive resources to start improving first? It's it's extremely fundamental. It really it goes back to the question you asked a little bit earlier about does the government support football? And I said there's there's too much uh, there's too much top down focus. I mean, China's China is a top-down society. Um, it's hierarchical. People tend to know their place. People down the food chain don't tend to question or argue towards people above them. Uh, for example, if 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 you're a, if you're in an office in China, people will treat the boss with much more reverence than typically with the Western setting. But why am I saying this? The, the point is basically that if if everything is top-down, then people kind of tend to sit around and wait to be told what to do. And I wouldn't say that people don't do anything in China uh, before they can, b- before they're, they're told what to do. But for example, if you want to go and play football in China, if, if you want, if you've got some buddies, you want to go and just kick a ball around. The first thing is you can't find a pitch. There's not that many pitches to just play, especially in the, in the big Chinese cities because there's so much pressure on land um, allocation. If you can't find one, because of the price of real estate in downtown areas, it costs a fortune to, to hire the, 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 the pitch. Then if you want to move out to the suburbs, find a, like a piece of grass, you can't find any kind of open field. It's all mostly been built on. Or if, if it is uh, available, then you can't just go and play there because someone's going to come along and say, hey, you're not allowed to play here because of this uh, regulation. Or then, okay, let's, uh, let's make an official team. So if you want to make like, um, or even just to make a, a club of some sort, there's lots of bureaucratic hurdles to go through because you, you're, you're getting people together and they're always a little bit wary of, of any kind of official organization, then it has to be connected to the local, the local authorities need to register it or, or, or even at the local neighborhood organization. Everything's very bureaucratic and often it's, it's the top down structure which permeates all the way to the bottom, which it makes free form, let's just go and kick a ball around activity extraordinarily difficult. Yeah, we're not painting the brightest picture for for football uh in, in china um and that's a shame i mean you know the world's largest sport and you know and then it's the world's largest country right so you know it's just it's 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 an odd it's just an odd uh, difference in you know you would just you would just say like if you were an alien landing on this planet what's your largest sport oh it's well it's football okay well what's your largest country well it's china oh then that must be the best cut you know the best footballers in the world must come from you know yet it's it, they would be shocked <laughs> to, to understand that it, you know right. well, yeah you yeah. would now you've been covering football you know and, and you mentioned uh and please tell us again what is um what is the media um that you used to run just covering football well i, I, st- I started a website called where would you football um 
back in, I think it was 2010, it was because my, I was actually a business journalist um, and I, I found football more interesting to write about, to be absolutely frank. And I started this as a side project and then I started kind of doing side gigs. I, I didn't really earn money directly from the website. Um, I would write for AFP, uh, some some reports I do for Reuters. Uh, I've re- also written for World Soccer, which is uh, actually probably probably the world's most well known football magazine. Actually, but um, they only would take. I would write for them maybe once a year, give like a, a review on on, on how, what's happening in China. Um, but it's my point. Basically, is that it's not something I've relied on exclusively to make a living. Yeah. So, well. And probably just as well. When they're ranked seventy fifth, <laughs> um, it, it would probably be right. Probably be hard to, but well, it's niche. It is super niche, yeah, and, and niche. you're That's you're often quoted thing. and interviewed, and and you know when people want to know about uh, football in China, uh, you're one of the top guys that, yeah. that people come to, even though it doesn't, as you That's say, right. happen that that often. Unfortunately, would the players like the Chinese football players in China when they're being interviewed? Do they do they have all the cliches down pat? Are they are they giving out that well we just got to go give it one hundred ten percent you know we just take it one game at a time and uh, you know we just got to get the ball deep we got to stick to our game plan and uh, you know do they do they do, are they trained do they do they know how to answer those questions that way yeah if if, if you thought Western sports players were cliche they've got nothing on Chinese guys it's it's really just like <laughs> you know fairly on a really uh, textbook. Literally, yeah. textbook. Well, the ball is round. Yeah, we just got to roll it down that field. We just got to roll it, and you know, and then at the end of it, when we get down there, we got to put it in the net, and that you know, we got that's what we got to do. Yeah, we got to yeah. get better putting that ball in the net and keeping it out of ours. You know, that's how we're going to win the game. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Thank you very much for explaining exactly. the basic rules of of football. What does the future of football in China look like? It looks uncertain because of COVID. There's not been any games played in home stadiums for two years now. So they've they, they, they basically have had the league the last couple of years, but they basically move all the clubs, basically divided the 16-team league into two groups of eight, and each group of eight played all their games in one stadium. They created like a bubble to to protect against COVID. The idea was, it was, it was reasonable. It, it was quite sensible in some ways because they don't want the league to be interrupted by players or staff contracting COVID and then they have to kind of quarantine the entire team Then everybody can't play games uh, for weeks and weeks. So basically that's the only way they can do it, given that China is pursuing a policy of zero COVID. That has been the situation for the past two seasons and then next season it looks like this is going to continue. So basically you, there's some fans being in these bubble stadiums, but obviously it's not the same as having regular games home and away at your own stadium. And um, that, that really is... I mean, domestic leagues are basically the bedrock of of, of any of football in any country. And if you can't have the players, you can't have fans in their own stadium for the years. It's, um, the risk of creating permanent damage to the interest level of the game is beginning to get quite significant. Last question. Somebody who has lived in China for, what, 15 years? Is that where we're at now? How many years have you been to China? Uh, coming up, coming up for seventeen. Seventeen big long years. It's not well planned, but uh, it's been a hell of a ride. Oh yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> can't plan life. Uh, it's, it's the way it goes. Yeah. You know, obviously, you have a pretty unique perspective in in the country, and uh, you know, as you said, a lot of that media background helping you now be the you know the, the senior media officer at the the China Europe International Business School, SEBS as us in the know call it. It's actually one of the most respected international MBA schools, uh, among other things that, that you can that you can go to. There's INSEAD, there's SEBS, there's HALT. Um, there's a few of them, but SEBS is is right up there. So, you know, good on you. You're at, you're at a great, great spot there. Uh, are there maybe one or two other guests who I can get you to recommend and name on the podcast so that we can go to them later and say, hey, your name was dropped by Cameron Wilson on our podcast as somebody that we need to get on there. <laughs> and they're going to go, oh, my gosh, Cameron mentioned me. I'm, I need to get on that podcast then. So who, who are a couple of people that you even as a, you know, as a listener of the podcast might want to hear their stories? I would say Rowan Simons. He would, if he had said my name, I would have been, wow, wow, Rowan Simon said my name. Because <laughs> he wrote, he's been in China since 1989. Wow. And he uh, wrote a book about Chinese football in 2008. Mm. 
Bambi Gopos. He's a he's a bigger expert than I am, and he has a very very rich uh, history with China. Also, he runs a grassroots football school, oh, wow. and he's done that for many years. Okay, so he would give you some uh, priceless insights. Well, thanks very much, Cameron. I really appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate you naming a couple of buddies that we could go after and uh, try to throw you under the bus uh, and get them on the uh, on the podcast later. But I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, I look forward to hearing what they have to say about me. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, cheers, cheers to all. It's been a really interesting conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation. And if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jian.